I'm pleased to introduce today Dr. Keith Siegel for his grand rounds on HIV and cancer, a growing problem. Dr. Siegel received his undergraduate degree, master's in public health, and his medical degree from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He then came to the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, where he completed a PhD, internal medicine residency, chief residency, as well as fellowships in both ID and general internal medicine. Dr. Siegel's research interests are in clinical factors related to the abnormal biology of lung cancer and anal cancer in patients with HIV. Dr. Siegel is the principal investigator on two ongoing NIH-funded studies to evaluate lung cancer screening and treatment in HIV-infected patients. Dr. Siegel currently serves as an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of General Internal Medicine here at Mount Sinai. He also serves as the director of the Cancer Corps of the Veterans National HIV Cohort. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Keith Siegel. Okay, well it's great to be back for my second Grand Rounds. So, uh, I'm going to be talking today about uh, HIV and cancer, an area that uh, I've spent most of my time on. I'll be starting with an update on HIV in general, uh, then talk about cancer as a leading HIV mor mor mortality cause, then I'm going to focus a little bit on uh, an area of particular interest to me, lung cancer and HIV, uh, then talk briefly about lung cancer screening in patients with HIV. And then another cancer that uh, I've spent a lot of time with, which is anal cancer and HIV. So I'm a little old school, like 2005, and I like to start my grand rounds off with cases. So here's a couple of cases. Case number one, a 20-year-old Norwegian man presents with myalgias and lymphadenopathy. Uh, he develops recurrent respiratory infections, and his wife soon develops a similar syndrome. Uh, fevers of unknown origin with frequent respiratory infections. Their two-year-old daughter also uh, develops persistent mucocutaneous candidiasis, uh, recurrent bacterial infections, including osteomyelitis. This patient had been in the Merchant Marine and had traveled in Africa and throughout Europe. He has continued ill health, but finds work as a long-haul trucker in Northern Europe. Ten years after his initial presentation with this undefined progressive syndrome, he dies in Norway. And that same year, ten years after the initial presentation, both his wife and daughter die. That year was 1976. This was the first definitively established European case of HIV infection. The patient likely acquired the virus sexually while uh, working in Central Africa in the mid-1960s. And now I'd like to... oh. Uh, so, numerous specimens were saved from the patient and his family and stored, and in 1986 they were sent by the physician who saw the patient for test, uh, in, in 1966 for testing, and they revealed uh, in sequencing HIV clade O. So now I'd like to move forward 40 years to one of my patients. This is a 67-year-old man with well-controlled HIV, a past medical history of COPD, hepatitis C, and osteoarthritis. He initially presented to me for hepatitis C treatment, but then stayed on with me for primary care. He's a smoker that had recently quit when I first met him. He had a 25-pack year smoking history. And although he, was, he had less smoking than would ordinarily qualify him for lung cancer screening, uh, I screened him as part of my uh, lung cancer screening study in 2015, and at that time he had no non-calcified nodules. In 2016, he was hospitalized with Legionella pneumonia, we see some, one of the images from that hospitalization, and his follow-up CT scan in the, the summer of 2016 revealed several new nodules. A repeat CT scan in the spring of 2017 demonstrated a 1.8 centimeter right upper lobe nodule and the biopsy of that nodule was read as carcinoma NOS. He was referred for surgery. On pre-op PFTs, he had mild obstruction, FEV1 of 65%. He underwent video-assisted thoracoscopic resection, which revealed T1N1 disease with one node positive. Biopsies revealed pleomorphic carcinoma that uh, appeared to be squamous cell. EGFR and KRAS testing was negative. PDL1 staining was 1%. Uh, because of his nodal disease, he underwent four cycles of cisplatin and taxotere. 
He had a rapid recurrence of cancer after chemotherapy. Uh, and after, I would say, much discussion, he decided to start immunotherapy, but it was never initiated because he died unexpectedly at home. With these cases, we see an, ex an example exemplary of the early days of AIDS and an example of what we face in the current era. So let's talk about HIV in 2018. There's no shortage of continued innovation in HIV medicine. The first two drug full regimen single tablet was just approved. There are now nine, if I'm counting correctly, single tablet full HIV antiretroviral regimens. And injectable antiretrovirals that are administered biweekly or monthly are on the near horizon as a treatment option. We are seeing interesting and exciting data with broadly neutralizing antibodies in recent papers in Nature and Nature Medicine demonstrating 15 plus weeks of viral suppression without antiretrovirals with a single antibody combination infusion. And this certainly isn't everything that's going on. This is the picture of HIV infection that we are getting in 2018, at least if you rely on pharmaceutical ads for your outlook. My favorite being the, uh, the stallions of Darunavir. <laughs> but this is probably a more accurate portrait of HIV in 2018. An aging pandemic where the majority of persons with HIV in the U.S. are now older than 50. Improved survival of, of adults uh, of HIV-infected adults associated with antiretroviral therapy and lessening newer HIV infections has led to an aging cohort. This table shows the proportion of people with HIV age 65 or older, as well as 45 to 65 in 2010 and 2030. We see marked growth in both groups projected, and the accompanying figure illustrates this growth and the demographic shift. This is the chief medical officer of our hospital who taught me how to treat HIV when I was a sort of young, bright-eyed ID fellow. And by the time I became an HIV primary care doc, we were already past the image on the, on the left, where ART was a complex handful of pills. This is now how things look, where ART is a single capsule or tablet, and we're managing a wide range of comorbidities related to both aging and HIV. This is a hugely relevant issue for Mount Sinai, where we actively care <laughs> for more than 12,000 people living with HIV. Primary care for HIV-infected patients represents numerous challenges. For one, we still struggle with engaging and retaining patients in care in the United States. This figure shows the HIV care cascade in 2014 where only 49% of U.S. patients were estimated to be virally suppressed, which is a huge problem. Among those in care, it's still challenging to achieve optimal outcomes. These data are viral suppression rates in New York City for people with HIV engaged in medical care. We see steady improvement over time, but still 17% have poor virologic control in 2015. We have a decent chunk of patients with poor viremic control, and even among those with good control, we see heterogeneity. Many patients who are well engaged and adherent have slow immune recovery and persistent immune activation, which leads to a chronic inflammatory state thought to contribute to risk of comorbidities. And correspondingly, we see in this figure comparing the prevalence of comorbid conditions for large cohorts of people with HIV with public and commercial insurance, comorbidities are on the rise for people with HIV in the late antiretroviral era. So here we see comparison of 2003 to 2013, the prevalence of various comorbidities, including cardiovascular events, hypertension, diabetes. HIV-related morbidity is declining. AIDS-related complications continue to decline. This figure is causes of death in the Swiss HIV cohort over time. The bright pink right here is AIDS-related causes, and it's shrinking while non-AIDS causes grow. The fastest growing causes of death uh, in this cohort and others are cardiovascular disease and cancer. HIV, likely due to resultant immunosuppression and inflammation, is increasingly recognized as an independent cardiovascular risk. Matt Freiberg from Vanderbilt 
conducted a large study in the VA and found higher rates of myocardial infarction associated with HIV after adjustment for classic risk factors. Traditional risk indices, like Framingham, may therefore not accurately reflect risk of cardiovascular disease in the setting of HIV. Hopefully this sells something that I always tell my wife when I get home exhausted after clinic. Uh, these issues make primary care of people with HIV very complex and sometimes exhausting. Manage management of ART, complex psychosocial issues and comorbidities add to this challenge. Health maintenance decisions require consideration of all of these factors. And one key part of health, ma health maintenance is the consideration of cancer and cancer risk, which is my major area of, re of research. Cancer is now a major issue in this group. Cancer is the leading single cause of death in many HIV cohorts. In this figure, we see cancer deaths by cancer type in the largest North American HIV cohort, the NA Accord. Uh, and we see the most common causes, which are lung cancer, lymphoma, Kaposi sarcoma, liver cancer, and anal cancer. And this illustrates one uh, intriguing part of studying cancer in people with HIV. Several of these cancers are relatively rare in the general population, but we see that they are much more common here. In fact, Cancer risk for specific cancer types differs markedly in people with HIV. From anal cancer, which is found at more than 30 times the amount that would be expected, as well as marked increases in Hodgkin lymphoma, liver cancer, stomach, and lung cancer. Uh, but there's also several cancers that are less prevalent, including prostate cancer and breast cancer. In comparison to the pre-antiretroviral era, when cancers, cancers related to immunosuppression dominated the patterns of cancer, uh, we now see more of the non-AIDS-defining cancers, which are solid tumors like lung cancer and liver cancer. This figure here shows projections of the most common cancers among U.S. persons with HIV, whereas the most common tumors in 2010 were lymphoma, KS, and lung cancer. By 2020, per their projections, it'll be prostate, lung, lymphoma, and by 2000, uh, lung lymph lymphoma and anus, and in 2030, prostate, lung, and liver. The question has arisen as to how viral suppression, so HIV control, relates to cancer risk. Using data from the large veterans aging cohort study with over 140,000 subjects, of whom more than 50,000 are living with HIV, we looked at this issue and found that patients with poor viral control had the highest cancer risk for AIDS-defining cancers and virally associated cancers, but that non-virally associated cancers had little difference in risk by HIV control level. However, all cancers were at higher risk in the HIV-infected patients in that study. Many of the studies that I've mentioned led the DHHS uh, to add HIV to its list of known carcinogens, joining an esteemed group including ultraviolet radiation and hot dogs. <laughs> Hopefully the proceeding has helped to demonstrate that there are many unique issues surrounding cancer and HIV. As clinical issues tend to be unique for each cancer type, I'd like to now focus on two cancers that I've done the most work with. Uh, these are also leading solid tumors in people with HIV and key drivers of morbidity. These two cancers are lung cancer and anal cancer. Coincidentally, they have many unique clinical questions in the HIV-infected population, and they're both highly relevant to our patients here at Sinai. So let's start with lung cancer. Lung cancer is the leading cause of death uh, lung cancer, just like in the general population, is the leading cause of, de of cancer death in people with HIV. People with HIV are at a two to four times greater risk of lung cancer than uninfected persons. This generates several questions. Why is there more lung cancer in the setting of HIV? How does HIV affect lung cancer outcomes? And is lung cancer screening appropriate in people with HIV? So let's first look at lung cancer risk. <clears throat> 
These, uh, this table shows the largest U.S. studies looking at lung cancer risk in people living with HIV, including our study in the bottom row uh, from the Veterans Aging Cohort Study. This column shows the adjusted risk ratios for lung cancer associated with HIV infection adjusted for smoking, uh, and they're consistently elevated from uh, a 70% greater risk to a 360% greater risk of lung cancer. Why is lung cancer risk increased in the setting of HIV? Well, there are issues related to standard lung cancer risk factors that I'm going to review, but we and others hypothesize that other unique HIV-related issues, including those related to immune dysfunction and pulmonary injury, may also contribute to this increased risk. Smoking is a huge issue among persons with HIV. Virtually every study that's measured smoking levels has found higher prevalence of smoking in populations with HIV. This large study from Annals, like many others, compared smoking behavior from a large ART-era cohort to the general population, which is over here, the general population, with prevalence of current smoking in the red being nearly twice that of the general population. This is going to lead to a tremendous amount of lung cancer in the U.S. HIV-infected population. This simulation study by Krishna Reddy at MGH projected lung cancer rates using some of our work and other related estimates. Krishna estimates that ART-adherent smokers will be 6 to 13 times more likely to die from lung cancer than AIDS-related causes, and that even more remarkably, that of the 644,000 people with HIV who smoke, nearly 60,000 will die from lung cancer unless smoking patterns change. This figure here is the cumulative mortality in the HIV infected population, the cumulative lung cancer mortality in the HIV infected population. Among heavy smokers with HIV, which is the top line in both figures, uh, more than 28% will die of lung cancer based on the simulation estimates. The average age at lung cancer diagnosis is less for people with HIV. These data are from the AIDS Cancer Match study, and it showed that the median age at diagnosis was four years younger for people with HIV, and that the risk increase for lung cancer was much higher in the younger age groups, as seen in the table, with very high increases in the, in the most young age groups. Some of the excess lung cancer uh, that we see in people with HIV may be explained by immunosuppression. This interesting meta-analysis, illustrated in the figure, compared cancer risk by anatomic site for kidney transplant recipients and people with HIV. The risk increase was very similar for both groups for lung cancer, supporting potentially a common cell-mediated immune pathway driving lung cancer risk. Because of this association with immunosuppression, uh, many studies have looked at CD4 count, which is readily available. But CD4 count has had inconsistent association with lung cancer risk for people with HIV. However, this study from the French hospital database on HIV did find that extended periods of low CD4 count were associated with a dose-response relationship <laughs> to lung cancer relative risk. In the figure, we see the magnitude of risk increase with each CD4 count exposure group. These are CD4 count ranges. With declining risk associated with higher CD4 counts and the, high, the lowest risk in the, in the group with CD4 counts on average greater than 500. An additional clinical, clinically monitored measure that we have been interested in is the CD4 CD8 ratio. The, this ratio of CD4 counts over CD8 cell counts is low in early and untreated HIV, but with antiretrovirals increases to uh, 1.0. It doesn't do this in all patients, though, for unclear reasons. Uh, the CD4 CD8 ratio is a marker of, well, is thought to be a marker of abnormal immune activation and is also thought to represent pro inflammatory potential. Prolonged low CD4 CD8 ratios have been associated with increased all cause mortality and an increased risk of non AIDS defining cancers. Uh, but prior to our work, it had not been uh, previously evaluated in lung cancer. We did the work that I'm about to describe with the Veterans Aging Cohort Study, which is the national VA HIV cohort uh, that I've conducted much of my work with. 
Uh, currently, over 50,000 veterans with HIV and 110,000 uninfected comparators uh, are in this cohort, and it encompasses all individuals in the VA system with HIV who are enrolled at the initiation of their HIV care. Demographically sim similar controls are then selected when a patient is enrolled, and uh, they're followed in the same calendar year. We use these data to study immunologic and infectious risk factors for lung cancer among veterans with HIV. When looking at incident lung cancers in the veterans cohort, we found that both long periods of low CD4 counts and low CD4, CD8 ratios were associated with increased lung cancer risk after adjusting for demographics, smoking, COPD, hepatitis C, alcohol, and drug use. What was interesting was that the magnitude of increased risk associated with low CD4, CD8 ratios was higher than with CD4 counts. Very low ratios, seen here, very low ratios were associated with a 3.5-fold risk increase for lung cancer. Uh, and in models where we combined all of our immunologic factors, uh, CD4 was actually no longer significant. And the CD4, CD8 ratio was the only independent immunologic risk factor for lung cancer. So low CD4, CD8 ratios and potentially low CD4 appear to be independent risk factors for lung cancer in patients with HIV. This suggests a potential role for immune disturbance. But what about lung injury from infections? Fatma Shevel, a member of our Veterans Cohort Cancer Research Group, used national HIV registry data on over 320,000 patients linked with cancer registries in 11 regions to look at pneumonia and lung cancer risk. She found that distant recurrent pneumonias, but not tuberculosis or PCP, were associated with lung cancer risk for people with HIV. Uh, this study had no smoking information, however, which is an important potential confounder of this relationship. So we built upon that work in our large analysis that I described uh, a couple slides ago from the veterans cohort, where we evaluated immunologic risk factors for lung cancer. We also looked at episodes of pneumonia, PCP, and tuberculosis, and their relationship with subsequent cancer risk. We excluded infectious episodes within a year of cancer diagnos diagnosis to limit reverse causality. Similar to the previous study, Fatma's study, um, and now adjusted for both smoking and CD4 count, we found that bacterial pneumonia uh, inpatient episodes were associated with a later risk of lung cancer, approximately a 70% to 80% increased risk of lung cancer. COPD is also a marker of lung inflammation and of interest in people with HIV. COPD is an independent risk factor for lung cancer, and HIV is an independent risk factor for COPD. So we wanted to look at both of these factors together. Again, in the veterans cohort, we identified 8,600 8, patients with COPD with recorded FEV1 values, of whom 27% had HIV. We first staged their COPD by degree of lung obstruction using the international gold criteria and found no difference in lung severity by, uh, I'm sorry, in a severity of lung obstruction by HIV status. Again, in this study, we found much greater incidence of lung cancer in the HIV-infected patients, with incidence rates as high as 700 cases per 100,000 person years in the HIV-infected group. Um, and that is a very high incidence rate, although that's because all of the patients in this study had COPD. This table showed our final incidence models from that study. We found that after adjusting for lung obstruction, HIV was still associated with an independent risk uh, an independently increased risk of lung cancer. And for increasing gold stage, there was also an increasing risk of lung cancer, but there was no interaction between lung obstruction and HIV, meaning that lung, lung obstruction had a similar magnitude uh, of risk for lung cancer in both uninfected and HIV-infected uh, participants. Uh, so there was no, no effect modification associated with lung obstruction. We therefore have found several issues, including smoking, immune disturbances, increased risk of pneumonia and CP COPD that are all potentially related to the increased risk of lung cancer we see in people with HIV. But what happens when people with HIV develop lung cancer? What's going on with lung cancer outcomes in HIV-infected patients 
in the so-called late antiretroviral era. And does mild immunosuppression or immune dysregulation affect lung cancer natural history or treatment responsiveness? So to slightly give away the punchline, uh, lung cancer outcomes have generally been worse in patients with HIV. I would argue, however, that comparing cancer outcomes for people with HIV is complicated uh, because of several issues, including treatment disparities that affect this group, competing risks from uh, non-cancer morbidity and mortality, and possible cancer treatment intolerance and increased treatment complications. But are lung cancers even the same uh, in this group, in patients with HIV? Are there differences in cancer characteristics? Well, that's one of the first things that we looked at. It doesn't seem like it. In both uh, studies that we've conducted in the VA uh, and in Medicare data, uh, as well as studies conducted by other investigators, we've found no difference in cancer stage by HIV status at presentation or in cancer histology. Uh, this figure is, uh, again, from our large, one of our large VA studies uh, where we see no difference in lung cancer stage at presentation. What about molecular characteristics of the cancer by HIV, HIV status? Uh, we collected 55 HIV infected, or, or 55 lung adenocarcinomas from people with HIV uh, from Sinai, Penn, Yale, and Memorial, and we matched those to demographically similar uninfected cases, and we found no difference in the prevalence of EGFR mutations, KRAS mutations, or ALK rearrangement. Uh, and similar studies have also not found, uh, this is probably the largest study of, of uh, lung cancer mutations in HIV, but um, there have not been any differences in other studies as well. Despite this, lung cancer outcomes for people with HIV have been worse in several population-based studies, at least, at least in the prior decade. These are data from the SEER Cancer Registry linked to Medicare claims, where we found markedly worse survival for lung cancer patients associated with HIV status. And this persisted even after accounting for several potential confounders, including competing risks of, of non-cancer death and cancer treatment. But our study, the one that I just showed you, and many others had very little ability to look at how people with HIV tolerate and complete cancer treatment, uh, and this could certainly confound the results. Uh, there's been very limited study of this issue of cancer treatment completion and, and tolerability in, in HIV. This table shows some of the largest studies uh, here's the N right here, which are still not very large, all of which have suggested either lower treatment tolerability or completion for patients with HIV. In addition, <coughs> marked lung cancer treatment disparities have also been documented for persons with HIV. This table summarizes some of the largest contemporary analyses which have been fairly consistent in finding lower rates of appropriate lung cancer treatment associated with HIV status. Uh, in, in this column, we see rates of stage-appropriate treatment in HIV-infected patients compared to uninfected. We evaluated this issue in the VA system, collecting uh, 1,456 lung cancer cases, 58 of whom, uh, I'm sorry, 581 of whom were living with HIV between 2002 and 2015. And we identified detailed lung cancer treatment information comparing the use of stage-specific uh, treatments by HIV status. This figure illustrates the proportion of lung cancer cases receiving stage-appropriate treatment. And interestingly, within the VA system, the proportions were similar for veterans both with and without HIV. This lack of treatment disparity within the, the VA system seems to have led to survival parity as well. Here we see overall survival for non-small cell cancer patients with HIV uh, by HIV status during the period of 2009 <coughs> to 2015, and we found no difference in overall survival. So lung cancer outcomes may still lag for people with HIV, but I would suggest that these, these differences may relate to treatment tolerability and potentially treatment disparities. When we looked in the VA in, in somewhat of an equal access system, with a lot of VA, uh, HIV experience, it's the largest single provider of HIV care in the United States, we found similar lung cancer outcomes. Let's talk briefly about a hot topic, immunotherapy. Immunotherapy is a hot topic in cancer treatment in people with HIV as well, 
However, uh, people with HIV were generally excluded from early cancer immunotherapy trials out of safety concerns. Uh, French investigators recently presented data on nivolumab in lung cancer patients with HIV, and there was no toxicity experienced in this 19 patient series and no safety concerns. Several other small series and case reports have also suggested similar efficacy and safety for cancer immunotherapy in patients with HIV, uh, but this is still an emerging area of interest. So what can we do with all this lung cancer? Well, addressing smoking is important, but let's talk briefly about another important intervention, lung cancer screening with low-dose CT. The evidence and subsequent practice guidelines for most forms of cancer screening were developed for the general population. Several groups, such as people with uh, comorbidities, such as HIV, may need additional considerations when applying screening evidence. Determining the harms and benefits of screening should consider unique factors impacting cancer risk, including the benefits of cancer treatment, the harms of screening or the harms of cancer treatment, and life expectancy. I've shown that cancer risk and life expectancy are altered in, in uh, patients with HIV. And the benefits of cancer treatment may also be altered in this group. But what about the harms of screening? Let's talk about that for a second. The National Lung Screening Trial and now the uh, Nelson Trial have established that lung cancer screening with low-dose CT is the standard of care for heavy smokers. But these trials did not consider HIV status. The false positivity rate of lung cancer screening is the top determinant of safety as positive screens can lead to invasive procedures like lung biopsies uh, that can have major complications, including death. Due to a higher risk of lung infections and emphysema, people with HIV have higher rates of incidental abnormalities in chest imaging, and this potentially affects the safety of screening. We use data from the VA system, once again, to evaluate this issue using a prospective cohort of asymptomatic patients who received chest CT scans. We found that HIV was not significantly associated with a higher prevalence of suspicious nodules. Both groups had uh, rates of nodules very similar to what we saw in the NLST. So armed with these findings, we wanted to formally evaluate lung cancer screening in smokers with HIV. And we turned to our colleagues at MGH who had developed something called the lung cancer policy model. The lung cancer policy model is a well-validated microsimulation model of lung cancer. It was used to inform the United States Preventative Service Task Force guidelines on lung cancer screening and it is a highly complex biologically based state transition model with over 40 interacting modules that can be used to simulate randomized control trials of both lung cancer screening and lung cancer treatment. Uh, using data from the analyses that I have described earlier in the talk as well as other data from other large HIV cohort studies, we modified this model to represent HIV. We used this modified model to then run a computer simulated randomized trial of lung cancer screening in patients with HIV, the HIV NLST you might call it. <coughs> this figure shows the results. The blue is the results from the actual NLST uh, where they observed a 20% 20, 20 reduction in lung cancer mortality associated with low dose uh, screening. The green, is our, is the, the green bar here is the uh, un HIV uninfected arm in our simulated study, and the orange bar is the uh, HIV arm in our simulated study. What we found was that smokers with a HIV derived a 90%, or, sorry, 19, 19% lung cancer mortality reduction, and we and concluded that screening with low-dose CT is likely to be safe, beneficial, and effective in HIV-infected smokers. We also evaluated alternative screening strategies for smokers with HIV using a technique called the efficiency frontier. We found that, uh, the, that smoking with the CMS criteria, the standard criteria of ages 55 to 77 with 30, at least 30 pack years of smoking, was an optimal screening protocol in HIV-infected smokers. Uh, but that the maximal lung cancer mortality reduction was actually with an alternative protocol, uh, which was screening starting at age 45 with at least 20 pack years of smoking. 
uh, and we feel that this issue deserves further study. So some key questions remain regarding lung cancer, uh, including whether we should be screening younger people with HIV who smoke for lung cancer, uh, what the role of targeted screening using some of the risk factors that we've identified um, might be, and also the role of HIV-targeted smoking cessation uh, as an additional um, lung cancer reduction method. Um, so anal cancer is not a cancer that we typically group with lung cancer, but as I mentioned, in the setting of HIV, uh, it probably should be, as it's highly prevalent and has a number of unique scientific and clinical issues in this group. Anal cancer is rare in the general population, but it's a major issue for people with HIV. Here we see a figure comparing the incident rate for anal cancer in men with HIV, here on the very top line, and MSM, men who have sex with men with HIV, to the incidence of several other cancers in uninfected persons using data from the NA Accord, that large US cohort study. As you can see, anal cancer incidence in this group is much higher than many solid tumors among uninfected persons. For instance, incidence of anal cancer in HIV-infected men is five times more frequent than cervical cancer in uninfected women. And among MSM, uh, the incidence of anal cancer is similar to prostate cancer in uninfected patients. Although it's not often fatal, Anal cancer represents 7.5% of cancer deaths in people with HIV due to its high prevalence. Anal cancer does lead to significant morbidity because surgical, radiotherapeutic, and chemotherapeutic treatments lead to frequent long-term uh, complications such as colostomy placement, proctitis, stricturing, and chronic pain. With our large at-risk population at Sinai, we've been able to study several clinically relevant issues in anal cancer epidemiology and early detection in this group. Anal cancer has a similar natural history to cervical cancer. HPV infection leads to dysplastic lesions, initially low-grade lesions that we call low-grade low squamous intraepithelial lesions, or, or L-cells, that progress to high-grade lesions, or H-cells, for which there's strong evidence uh, that H cells are the precursors, or, I'm sorry, are the precursors to invasive anal cancer. We looked at the prevalence of these precancers here at Sinai. From 2,075 patients with HIV screened with anal cytology, we compared the prevalence of high-grade abnormalities by sexual risk group, and we found a 12 percent prevalence of H cell in uh, in our uh, men who have sex with men. So 8% in HIV-infected women and 4% in heterosexual men. The progression of dysplasia to cancer is seen here. Using our large cohort at Sinai, we then looked to clarify the risk of progression of these common lesions, first looking at the risk of progression of low-grade lesions. We followed 168 uh, L-cell patients, anal L-cell patients, for a median of 20 months and we looked at the rate of lesional progression according to their HPV infection at baseline and at follow-up. We found that patients with persistent HPV type 1618, which are the, the most common uh, high-risk types associated with invasive cancer, uh, infection at both baseline and follow-up, here in the first row, were associated with a 70% risk of their low-grade lesions, their l cells, progressing to high-grade lesions. Those with intermittent infections had roughly a 50% risk of progression, and those with consistent 16-18 negativity had the lowest risk of lesional progression. In multivariable models, the strongest predictors of progression of these low-grade lesions to high-grade lesions were baseline HPV 16-18 positivity with a hazard ratio of 3.2, and persistent infection with HPV 16-18, which was associated with a greater than five-fold risk of progression to high-grade lesions. The progression of high-grade lesions to cancer is also very important and somewhat unclear. Using data from SEER and Medicare, once again, we like that data, uh, we determined the risk of high-grade anal uh, dysplastic lesions progressing to invasive cancers. Using a cohort of more than 500 men with HIV who had high-grade dysplastic anal lesions, we found a 1% per year risk of progression for these lesions to invasive carcinoma with a 5 to 
risk over a five-year period. In response to the high prevalence of dysplasia in our population, in 2009, we began offering anal cancer screening to all HIV-infected patients in the Sinai system, regardless of risk factors. Initial screening is performed with anal cytology, and specimens with ASCUS abnormalities are higher are then referred to high-resolution anoscopy, often with Dr. Geiza. Uh, anoscopy examination with biopsy is then performed, and if biopsies demonstrate high-grade lesions, then uh, generally electrocautery ablation uh, is the treatment of choice for those lesions. Uh, and over the last nine years, um, we've accumulated more than, now more than 3,500 patients that have received uh, high-resolution anoscopy, which has yielded a very large tumor repository, I'm sorry, tissue repository, and a clinical database that contains over 7,000 specimens that are useful for characterizing this disease. Um, and over that time period, we've diagnosed uh, more than 15 invasive cancers. But the question still remains um, whether or not we should screen for anal cancer. Anal cancer screening remains somewhat controversial for patients with HIV. The role of screening is inferred from cervical cancer data um, because the incidence of anal cancer prior to screening was similar to cervical cancer also <coughs> prior to widespread screening. Therefore, a large national RCT <coughs> called the ANCHOR study is evaluating this issue. It randomizes 6,000 patients with HIV and anal high-grade lesions, anal H cells, to surveillance or treatment. Um, and the outcome that, that will be measured is anal cancer incidence in those two groups. ANCHOR is about half enrolled, so it's going to be several more years before we have uh, anything resembling a definitive answer on this, um, but it certainly will be very interesting. Meanwhile, uh, with data from the VA and from our patient cohort, we're attempting to further clarify the natural history of this disease and determine why there's so much anal cancer in people with HIV. Similar to the results I showed you earlier for lung cancer, uh, we looked at peripheral CD4, CD8 ratios and the risk of several cancers in veterans with HIV. This figure shows the adjusted hazard ratios associated with these cancers and persistent low CD4, CD8 ratios. These are the point estimates for the hazard ratios. Um, interestingly, the only two non-AIDS defining cancers that we found to be associated with low ratio values were lung and anal cancer. So to, so to take this a step further and investigate the role of CD4 and CD8 cells in the development of anal cancer, we looked at the infiltration of these cells in precancerous tissue. Using samples from our cohort, we quantified the infiltration of CD4 and CD8 cells in high-grade lesions and in the surrounding stroma. Here we see the quantity of CD4 and CD8 cells in benign tissue versus precancerous tissues by HIV status. Uh, the HIV cases are the dark bars. HIV was associated with a marked increase in CD4, C, I'm sorry, CD8 cell infiltration, much like what we're seeing in the peripheral blood. And the typical ratio of CD4 to CD8 was reversed in tissue as well. And interestingly, this reversal was also associated with lesional aggressiveness. Um, so more CD8 cells meant that the lesion was more likely to persist after treatment. We're continuing to investigate and in explore these unique findings. Uh, thanks to a Department of Medicine pilot grant, we're further investigating the local immune disturbances in these lesions by characterizing these CD8 cells that we're finding in excess um, and looking at gene expression. So, HIV-infected patients are at greater risk of developing a wide range of cancers. Many of these cancers are likely related to chronic opportunistic viral infections. There's an unclear role of immunosuppression in the non-viral cancers that we're seeing in excess, but it does seem to be playing a role. Um, cancer incidence persists and, I would argue, is growing in the post-antiretroviral era for people with HIV. HIV-infected patients are at greater risk for developing lung cancer than people without HIV. This relationship <laughs> appears to be independent of smoke smoking. In terms of lung cancer screening, HIV-infected patients might not have an altered risk-benefit profile, and all the evidence that we have so far is that it's potentially a valuable intervention in this group. Anal cancer uh, is a significant source of morbidity in ART-era HIV-infected patients uh, related to persistent HPV infection. 
and disturbances in CD4, CD8 balance may be important in both lung and anal cancer and may influence the tumor microenvironment. Thank you guys so much for your attention. <laughs>